Sup, y'all, and welcome to the Geography of Industry and Services, Part 6. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at contemporary manufacturing by asking this essential question. What forces and organizations affect contemporary manufacturing? Now, Edward Ullman's spatial interaction model is also sometimes called his conceptual frame, and it consists of three main concepts. The first one being complementarity. Now, this occurs when the demands of one region are met by the surplus supplies of another. Now, this reality causes movement, movement of goods. A workplace, such as a factory or office building, is an example of a place with a demand for labor, while a residential neighborhood nearby would provide a source of workers. In simpler terms, a sawmill requires logs, while a forest would provide them. And here, for example, people in the Northeast would like to have oranges, but they cannot grow them locally. Within the concept of complementarity is the term comparative advantage. Now, this term provides a relative measure of the degree of economic complementarity between two countries with respect to regional specialization. What that means is that all other things being equal, one nation will export goods to another nation when it can produce certain goods at a lower relative cost than the importing nation can. In all these images you see in the screen, each of these countries has a certain comparative advantage. Maybe you didn't know that more diamonds come from Botswana than any other single country, or more palm oil comes from Indonesia. Regardless, they all have a comparative advantage because of their location or because of their climate or natural resources. The second key concept is transferability. Now, this refers to the ease with which products can be moved. So durability, perishability, weight, and value are a few of the many concerns when transporting goods. For instance, high-value, low-weight goods such as jewelry are imminently transferable and exported on a global scale, while heavy, low-value goods such as concrete blocks are often used very close to where they are produced. Now, distance usually requires some amount of effort, money, and energy to overcome. The increase in time and cost that usually comes with increasing distance is called the friction of distance. Now, if the friction of distance is too great, interaction will not occur in spite of complementarity. In general, the friction of distance has decreased over time as transport technology has improved. Now, the third and final concept is intervening opportunity which reduces the attractiveness of more distant locations. It is the third basis for interaction, although it is typically considered the reason for a lack of interaction between two complementary locations. Complementarity between two locations will only generate movement if there is no intervening or closer location. The flow of goods that would otherwise occur between two complementary locations may be diverted to a third location if it represents an intervening opportunity a closer complementary alternative with a cheaper overall cost of transportation. So look at this map that shows U.S. timber production by county in 2007. Being in South Florida, you may need some wood, for example, if a hurricane was approaching. So you head to Home Depot. And it is highly likely their wood would come from someplace more local, as in the southeast, as opposed to someplace further away, as in the northwest. Altogether, this scenario combines the concepts of intervening opportunity, complementarity, transferability, distance decay, and so on. Just be sure you bring the right vehicle to do the job. Now, aside from what we previously covered, there are other major influences on trade and the contemporary geography of manufacturing. And one of those influences deals with regional and international trading blocks. The General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GATT, was organized in 1948 and was in effect until 1994. This initiative assisted in creating a multilateral trading system and reducing tariffs. In 1995, the World Trade Organization, WTO, took the place of GATT. The WTO seeks to supervise and liberalize international trade, making it freer. It also provides a forum for negotiations and for settling disputes. Currently consisting of 162 member states, more than 97% of all global trade is conducted through this supranationalist organization. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or the OECD, was born after World War II to coordinate the Marshall Plan and promote world trade through democracy and market economies. It has 34 member states, producing more than two-thirds of the world's goods and services, with more than 70 developing and transition economies working with them. 
Of course, other supranationalist agreements function as major facilitators of international trade, such as the European Union, Mercosur in South America, ASEAN in Southeast Asia, and even closer to home with NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. In this great infographic, you can see the top 15 trading partners of the U.S., with the green arrows showing exports and the red arrows showing imports. You can clearly see the impact of NAFTA and how near things are more related than distant things. You can also see the stark trade imbalance between the U.S. and countries like Saudi Arabia and especially China. And certainly the post-Fortis trade networks could not operate efficiently without relatively cheap and abundant energy resources. As technology has improved, more efficient fuel sources have been needed, making certain regions more valuable and some previously valuable regions less so. The harvesting and use of wood as a primary energy source reached its peak in the middle of the 19th century and has declined ever since. Coal, as a total percentage of global energy use, reached its peak in the 1920s. The geopolitical goal of sea power reached its peak during this era as well. Colonies and possessions for coaling stations were strategically pursued by core states. Oil peaked around the mid-1980s when it represented around 50% of the global energy supply. Today, major industrial complexes are not confined to oil fields. They are fed through a huge system of pipelines and oil tankers on a global scale. However, there are always risks, as was the case with the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010, with an estimated total of almost 5 million barrels of crude released into the waters. Increasingly, natural gas has gained ground as a cheaper and somewhat more environmentally friendly alternative to oil. Many new reserves of natural gas have been accessed through fracking, the process of fracturing rock and shale under the ground through pressurized liquids to extract gas and sometimes even oil. Other sources are used, such as some nuclear energy, and also from biofuels such as ethanol, and even renewables such as geothermal, hydroelectric, solar, and wind. However, these are used to a much lesser degree. Even though these sources may be supposedly cleaner, they are not nearly as cheap or efficient as fossil fuels, yet. Stephen, to check your mirror, signal, and now pull into traffic. There he is! Easy! Turn right! Follow him to the right! It's okay. Now, normally, you would not be going 65 down the wrong way of a one way street. Ah. Apply the brakes. Now put it in reverse. Please! 